is an unspoiled network podcast. This is unspoiled covering Doctor Who season eight, episodes nine and ten. Surprise, bitches. <laughs> Flatline and In the Forest of the Night. In these episodes, we have got some weird two-dimensional monsters who are trying to take over, and we have got some trees that are just trying to help. Welcome to Unspoiled. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. I'm Jamie. All right. So Jamie came to me with the suggestion from people in the Whovian group. Is that correct? Yeah, it was actually Tori Holly's suggestion, but other people are like, oh, that's a good idea. Thank you, Tori. Appreciate you. Um, yeah, this was a good idea. We're going to do two episodes for the next episode also. Mm -hmm. And then the Christmas special will be a standalone, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I like the, the consensus is pretty much that this season is one that we just need to get through. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to speed that up. Um, that's sort of the tone that Owen and I were taking that tact as well with the, uh, Clone Wars where we're getting through the first season. We did five episodes for the, the upcoming next episode. And we're going to do five for the one after that as well, which will pretty much finish us on season one. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's just like, I don't really like to do this usually because it's just not how Unspoiled is meant to work. But if everybody feels that this is like the best way to handle it, and I personally have not been enjoying the coverage for some time. I, I, it really takes a while to convince me of that. You know, it's like, I, I'll have off weeks. I'll have off months. Sometimes we have several episodes in a row that are not very good, but it's when it's like been longer and you're starting to get really irritated that, and especially when the rest of the audience is like, look, we're trying to help you not have to go through <laughs> what we went through. Then I'm sort of like, all right, you know what? I will veer away from what I try to do with Unspoiled. I really want to approach everything with the same method to be fair. But sometimes life isn't fair. What can you do? Ironically, I think these episodes are pretty good. Yeah, I actually did like both of these better than the others. So, you know, it, but not that I regret doing two in a row at all. I right. feel like that actually did work. I feel like I maybe liked them more than I would have if we had done them each separately. I don't know. I guess we'll see. Um, so have had you watched either of these? Um, I feel like I had watched, it, at least in some capacity, I'd watched Flatline. Okay. Um, but I was not fully paying attention. I had no memory of the forest one. The forest one. Can you remember why it's called of the night with a K? I think that's wrong. Um, everywhere else is just night, like N I G H T, and apparently it's from a poem. Oh, so HBO just fucked up. Yeah. Wild. Okay. Because I was like, I don't remember is like, I thought maybe the girl, the little girl's last name was Knight, you know, mm. like something like that. I was like, did I just miss? I don't feel like they even mention it. No, they do say her name or na her last name started with an A. Okay. Um. So, all right, let's start with Flatline. And this is a really neat idea that there, this is something that, uh, have you read OMG? Not the wind in the door. What's the other, the, the wrinkle in time? No. Um, there is a point at which they are tessering to a, you know, different planet 
probably a different dimension also. And they wind up on a two dimensional planet for a second where they all cannot breathe. And there is a real feeling of like panic and they fly off of it. And the kids are like, what the fuck was that? And I think Mrs. What's it is like, yeah, sorry. That was a 2d planet. It's actually super fun. If it doesn't kill you, it's a really good time to just be in like flat two dimensional space, but it was not supposed to be where we went. So my bad. Sorry about that. You almost died. And that was what I kept thinking about with this. Um, so basically there's aliens that are two dimensional and they are trying to force everything on planet earth into two dimensions as well is like what it boils down to. Yeah. It's like they're trying to figure out what these three dimensions are. Because they do eventually take on three dimensions. Yeah. So it's like they were initially doing, okay, we're going to turn everything into two dimensions. But then they eventually are like, oh, wait, I get it. Three. Oh, that is genius. And then they just start to do that too. Um, and the the effect is actually pretty neat, I thought, of everybody like getting flattened and the way mm-hmm. that they sort of disappear. Also, I really enjoy the artwork of them like in the that tunnel yeah um i just thought that was really neat there's just a lot of fun elements to this episode that are different and i also felt like it was filmed well uh the next episode i feel like less so and i feel like some of that is just that they have to hide how the forest isn't really in london do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so in order to do that, it's just a uh, bit of a bunch of camera cheats that you have to do in order to make this work. So I don't blame them. But this one, because of the simplicity of the surroundings, I feel like they were able to do something a little bit more interesting with the camera work. And I really liked it. Um, and also Clara gets to sort of be... The doctor, Mm -hmm. which is also an interesting concept. And that's not like unheard of for this show. They do have our companions occasionally getting separated and having to make decisions for themselves, you know, but, um, I don't know. I just, making decisions for themselves, but not taking on the the role of him. Yeah. Yeah. Cause she had to like lead this charge and. Mm -hmm figure out this mystery because he was stuck inside the tiny TARDIS. Yeah. Oh my God. That tiny TARDIS. I love when he sticks his hand out (laughs) and starts dragging the TARDIS. That was so good. I was really like, there were a lot of moments this episode where I was like, oh, that's cool. That's fun. I like that. When she first said you have to like, like the Adams family, I was like, what is she talking about? And then when he sticks his hands, I was like, oh, like, (laughs) like the thing. I get it. That's clever. Uh, So the episode starts off with this guy who is on the phone with like emergency services and he's just telling them, listen, they're everywhere all around. We've been so blind. And then there's this like roaring sound and a scream. He gets pulled away from the phone and then we see like this smear on the wall. And it's such a weird thing because the rest of the episode It's not like this. Mm -hmm. This is the only one that's like this, which I found to be a little bit of a shame, but also I understand why not. But the smear, when the camera gets focused on it going in a certain direction, you see that it is his face and him screaming and his eyes are like obscured, which again, that's not really a thing either for the rest of the episode. Like nothing happens to anybody else's eyes. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, that's what's going on with him. Um, and I just, I when I saw his face like that, I was like, oh, that is really freaky. Ooh, what is this? And those people never come back. No. Right? Like, they're just dead. Yeah. That's fucked up. I really yeah, thought we were going to get them back. I really did. The one, the um, police officer... She, it ends up with her like nervous system on the wall. Mm-hmm. 
like it's a mural. Like it's, it looked almost like trees without leaves and then like a reflection. And at first I was like, oh, that's neat. And then they said it was the nervous system. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's very, uh, it's gory yeah. in its way, you know, like, ew. So I kind of knew with that, like, there's no way that people are going to come back. I thought that because not everybody has it happen that way, that some of them would be recovered, mm. you know, mm, but no. Um, so I I have to talk about this. I don't want to, but it's, you just can't not talk about it because this episode, it's less of a thing, but it comes back next episode in force is just the whole, Mr. Pink doesn't want Clara hanging out with the doctor for some reason now. And um, yeah, he's never said that he didn't want her to. She told him she didn't want to. Right. That, and that's what's so weird. They're really treating it like she's hiding it from him because he won't approve. But we know that isn't how it is. He, she's hiding it from him because she's lied to him. Right. And lied to the doctor. So this comes up in this episode where it's very clear, like, she's worried about what she's going to tell him. Mm -hmm. And so she's doing the whole, make sure to get me back in time, make sure that it's like exactly when I left. And then the next episode, there's a lot of like arguing about it and him being like, we literally thought we were going to die and you were still lying to me, which honestly, what the fuck, Clara? Yeah. Sincerely. I really want to know what the fuck, like, I don't get what the writers are doing. I really don't. It's. Okay, so I liked these episodes. So, audience, give me some space here. But mm -hmm. it's really like they don't know how to have conflict between her and her boyfriend that makes any sense. So they're expecting us to believe somehow that Danny is the one who is saying don't travel with the doctor. Right. And we're supposed to forget that two episodes ago – she told the doctor that she didn't want to travel with him. She was so mad at him because he made her make the decision on what was going to happen to the earth when he knew nothing was going to happen to it. She felt so manipulated and used or whatever that she didn't want to have anything to do with him anymore. And we're supposed to forget that Danny is like, you should probably just let yourself cool off a little bit because mm -hmm. you're not going to give up traveling with him. And then she just starts lying to everyone. Yep. <laughs> and I guess we're supposed to be on her side because she's the companion. It doesn't make sense. Like, tell me why you're lying to everyone. Like, yeah. what is the motivation? It's just like, it's one thing if you're lying for a perfectly good reason, but if you're lying for no reason at all, then I can't be on your side. Right. And that's then it what just it is. seems like you're a dickhead who doesn't like want to have a relationship with this person that you claim to love. You don't. You obviously don't. How could you? You wouldn't behave this way if you loved them. So Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, just weird. Like I said, I didn't want to talk about it like because we all know that this doesn't make sense. Yeah. And we all know very transparently why it's been written like this because they don't know what to do with Danny. That's really right. what it comes down to. But right. I have and to mention it because it's just such a thing. Uh, it's like they don't want him to be the bad guy. Like, really? So mm -hmm. they didn't have these words coming out of his mouth. I don't want you traveling with a doctor. Mm -hmm. But they also don't want her to be the bad guy. It's you so can't weird. have it both ways. Like... like what it would have been a little bit more interesting, I think, if after that thing, when he when she tells him what the doctor did, instead of being like, maybe you should just cool off, he totally took her side and went really hard. Like, that was a fucked up thing to do. You're right. Fuck that guy. You should not hang out with him anymore. I can't believe he put you in that position and was so fiercely on her side that when she changed her mind, she was embarrassed to tell him. 
Right. That would be something because that's happened. At least that would be a reason for lying. Mm hmm. And then her lies aren't even good. No. No. She's super bad at lying. Yeah, the whole thing is just a mess. It really is. <laughs> I don't know why. I just. Yeah. And nobody could have liked this. Right? Like. I just have to imagine that everybody watching this was just sort of like, I don't remember it going that way. What is happening? Um, when I asked that question to the audience in the Hoogian group, like, what was it about Clara that people didn't like? A lot of the answers were, I didn't have a problem with Clara until she started lying. Mm -hmm. Until she started lying to the doctor, until she started lying to Danny. Or just in general, I didn't have a problem until she started lying. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's no quicker way to just get me not on somebody's side than to have them do this kind of shit for no reason. I could, like I said, I'll, I'll forgive lying even if it's for, even if it seems like the wrong thing to do if I understand why they're choosing to do it. Mm -hmm. But that's not how that goes. Right. A lot of and the this time. Is I feel like this is a pretty strongly written episode with this really weak point of not knowing how to have Clara do what you want without it making no sense. Right. Or how to get them to whatever the conclusion is going to be, whatever point it is they're trying to get to mm -hmm. by having this mess beforehand. Yeah. Like it's not hard to make Danny an interesting character. He's got interesting things about him. Mm -hmm. So just make him interesting. Don't make him the enemy. And like you said, they can't, they haven't even done that. Right. And so it's even more baffling. Like you guys can tell that he's not a bad dude. You don't seem to want him to be a bad dude. So what's the deal? Right. Don't gaslight your audience by making us think, wait, when did Danny say he didn't want her to travel with mm -hmm. her, with him? Like what is... Did I miss that? And they just want you to be like, I guess I did. <laughs> um, so, all right. I just wanted to get that out of the way because yeah. like you said, otherwise I did enjoy these and I just felt like that needed to be addressed, but I don't want it to be a whole thing. Um, so yeah, that's what happens in this first scene is her like telling the doctor like, well, just make sure that I get home in time, yada, yada, yada. Doesn't she actually, she says that Danny has gotten possessive and he doesn't want her even leaving so much as a toothbrush on the TARDIS. Yes. Girl. Like she's making him sound like a fucking dickhead. Yeah. Really the kind of like, thing that if I heard that from a friend, I'd be like, okay, we need to have a talk about your fucking yeah. dude here and what the problem is. Like, when did you get into an abusive relationship? Mm -hmm. Because that's abusive. Yep. I can't tell if the doctor sees through her lies or not. What do you think? I kind of well, get the feeling later that he knew she was full of shit. Because he seems really unsurprised. When he finds out that's not how it was actually going down. Yeah. I also think that he immediately gets distracted by whatever else is going on. True. And really stops thinking about whatever it is that she's doing as far as her like personal life goes. Yeah. Because they get out of the TARDIS and realize that they are not where they're supposed to be. They're mm -hmm. in England. They're in Bristol. That's not where she lives. And he's getting like weird readings from the TARDIS. And the door is wee. The door is half its normal size. It's really funny to watch the doctor squeeze himself out of that door. Yeah, that was a good time. Everything to do with the TARDIS shrinking is really fun. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed all of that. It was such a weird concept. It sort of reminded me of uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. You know how there's that, that oh, tiny door at the Mike end of the hallway? TV. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, that too, yeah. But the door at the end of the hall is the one that they go through to like get to the main chocolate garden area. Yeah. And uh, Or Alice in Wonderland. Or that, yeah. Honestly, that really is probably more the thing because I think he even quotes Alice in Wonderland in the movie a few times, maybe in the book too. <laughs> But uh, 
Alice in Wonderland for me is like just a fucking horrifying fever dream that I never want to think about or revisit again. I so, love Alice in Wonderland. I find it to be like a bad trip. Which well, is, it was. It, it was. was. He was on opium and shit when he was writing it. That comes through. Um, <laughs> I just, I've always loved Alice in Wonderland. I love all the art from it. I love the Disney movie. Um, it's one of my favorite things. So any, anything that reminds me of it, I'm like, Ooh, tiny doors. Ooh, little bottles. <laughs> I mean, you're you not alone. It? There's a lot of marketing <laughs> for stuff yeah. that's like Alice in Wonderland themed. I decorated so. my bedroom once with all Alice in Wonderland stuff. I like printed pictures, like artwork and framed it and bought some like fabric roses and then painted them really sloppy red like they are in the movies and, um, <laughs> Yeah, I love Alice in Wonderland. That's like, yeah, it's just there are parts of it, like the tiny bottles and the little door and stuff that I thought were cute. But then you get into like the weird hookah smoking, <laughs> you know, uh, caterpillar I love or the caterpillar. everybody <laughs> hating her and wanting to chop her head off. Hmm. Uh, not not my favorite. I think that was part of it as well as a kid. Like I had been reading a lot of um Narnia books and mm -hmm. those Narnia books problematically are like, yeah, human children who are not of our world, you are our leaders. <laughs> like, which is kind of honestly pretty fucked up. Just like anybody who's naturally born of Narnia, you don't get to rule. These strange interlopers, these colonizers <laughs> are the ones who are meant to be in charge. Uh, but, you know, it was sort of comforting in that, like, oh, I I could go to a magical land and everybody would love me and defer to me and want me to be in charge. And how cool. And then you have Alice in Wonderland where everybody's like, bitch, where the fuck are you? Who are you? No, no. Somebody take care of this. This is weird. I don't like her. <laughs> and I was just like, this isn't nice. I don't like it. So. There's this crazy movie from the 80s. It was a TV movie. I think it was Two Nights. This Alice, like live action Alice in Wonderland. And it's so bonkers. And it always stuck with me, but no one ever talked about it. And I got to a point where I was like, did I make that up? <laughs> and I, so I looked it up on Amazon. Like, let me see if there's a DVD of it. And there is. And I immediately ordered it because I was like, this thing, it's got Ringo Starr in it as the mock turtle. It's oh got all these God. famous people in it. It is so weird. And I've been too afraid to watch it because I know it's going to be bad. It's a TV movie from the 80s. <laughs> but I had to have it because it's just it's one of the weirdest things that's ever existed. I bet Rashawn would remember it. Probably. She's good I'm for that kind of thing. I'm ask her about it. It's one of those things where I feel like she probably would have been as fascinated by it as a kid <laughs> as I was. Where it's just like, what am I watching? Yeah, I wonder what her feelings on Alice in Wonderland are. I feel like we've talked about it, but I don't remember what she said. Um, And, and it's sort of weird, too, that I have this feeling about it because I loved – uh, Return to Oz, which is like talk about a fever dream, <laughs> yeah, right? Return to Oz is terrifying, and I don't yeah. know why I liked that, but didn't like Alice in Wonderland. That doesn't make any sense, but there it is. <laughs> um, anyway, so he begins to realize that like there is power being drawn from the TARDIS. At first, he's just like delighted at the fact that this is happening at all. He finds it fascinating. He gets annoyed that Clara is more preoccupied with the fact that she isn't where she's supposed to be than enjoying how he doesn't know something for a change. And I'm like, yeah. I, I don't know if you know this, but not everybody is as excited about your experience as you are. That's just sort of human nature. No offense. I thought you would appreciate him admitting that he doesn't know something. I mean, I have in the past but it is more of a thing now where they're they're doing things that he genuinely is like what the fuck is this so it's losing a little bit of its novelty because they're you know and and it's it's not even as much of a like that has been a thing in the past as well but it's usually been that he thought he knew and he got it wrong mm -hmm. and now it's sort of more 
I'm going to freely admit up front that I don't know what this is and I'm trying to figure it out. Um, so then we have this weird cut as they're like looking at the small, tar- the small end tar- TARDIS. It's not small, small yet. As we see later, it can go a lot farther than that. Yeah. But it's about the size of, say, a power box. Like, for, yeah, you like, know, like for an apartment building or something. If he's like, let's imagine he's six feet tall. It's still probably like five foot eight. Mm hmm. Um, and we cut from there to Riggsy, mm-hmm. who is a graffiti artist. Yes. And he is assigned to community service to clean up the graffiti. And the dude who is in charge of the community service it's a is real a filch. miserable fuck. <laughs> yeah. Filch is a good comparison. Yeah, definitely. And I really thought, I really did the whole time, that he was going to turn out to be an alien. Hmm. Because he's so unpleasant. And just for like no reason. He's just an asshole. Yep. And he, he also has so no imagination. Yeah, that as well. The fact that like he ha- he the the psychic paper doesn't work on him. Yeah. I really thought it was going to turn out to be that he was somehow either an alien and actually like one of the things or that they had like got to him somehow and in a different way than everybody else where they just like kill them, that he was going to have been drained of like his humanity somehow. But no, he just doesn't have any. Mm-hmm. It's just a perfectly regular human explanation. <laughs> um, and Riggsy is – very adorable. I enjoy him a great deal. He has this whole like thing later on where he's about to sacrifice himself for no good reason. And uh, Clara has to be like, yeah, I mean, you could definitely do that if you want, or I could just put my hairband here and hold it in place. And it really reminded me of uh, Rose and um, Finn when he's about to sacrifice himself, like, you know, flying into the cannon in mm-hmm. uh, Last Jedi, and she just like crashes into him and is like, "You fucking idiot!" And he's like, "Why? What? What did you do?" And she's like, "Uh, I only saved your life, Dodoy," and then passes out. That's how that scene goes, right? Yeah, I mean, word for word. Yep, pretty much. Very emotional. Dodoy is a thing they say in Star Wars. <laughs> Would that be so amazing? <laughs> That's more like a character name. Yeah. There would be a character in Star Wars called Dodoy. <laughs> um <laughs> it would be like Dodoy something, some last name. Dodoy Shaboy. Nope, it wouldn't rhyme. They rhyme, don't they, sometimes? Not really. No? Alright. But Jamie would know. <laughs> so I mean I'm sure there are some, but it's not like a common practice. So, oh God, this, this bit with like later on, this dude who's running the thing is just like, oh, who cares that all those people who got taken, like they were all just the scum for community service. And I'm like, dude, that's like problematic at best, even if you were talking about people who are literally on death row. Yeah. And you're talking about people who just got community service, which is just the like most, you know, penitence light that I can think of. And it's such an extreme view to take on people like that. Like, wow. Okay, guy. It's just, that's, that's your job. And I don't know. If it's just that you've like met too many terrible people in your job and if I should have some sympathy for you, but it just really feels like you want a reason to feel better than them. And you have a shitty, thankless job and the only way to feel superior is to be like, well, you're a criminal. They always make community service leaders not necessarily this extreme, but like, did you watch Better Call Saul? Only like the first season and a half. 
I can't remember which season it was in where he had cut community service, but he had like a real hard ass, you know, foreman or whatever who was out there like making sure that they got there on time and mm-hmm. did their job while they were there. And even on Grey's Anatomy, Meredith had community service. She was out like picking up trash and she had to like go back to the hospital for something and she had to convince her community service leader like who was being a hard ass to let her go by actually diagnosing like oh you what's this on your neck like that you need to get that checked out come with me so it's like why this is a common occurrence with television that why can't you have a nice person who's like yeah you know you guys got yourselves in this situation but i don't need to make it worse for you yeah i wonder what that like is that a thing guy people out there who have done community service let me know i am curious is this a thing that like happens often where it's just somebody who has no tolerance and is kind of an umbrage about it yeah because it feels like it's a trope at this point i'm wondering like why yeah it can't be everyone who does that job just has like absolutely no respect for the people who got themselves into a situation where sometimes it might not be that they were actively trying to break the law. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're somebody who does graffiti, like, yeah, the worst thing you should have to do is paint over your own art, Mm -hmm. but you don't need to be abused while you do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a fucked up value system. Like there's way worse things. Just, there's just way worse things. It's fine. Um, so let's see, I'm trying to see what happens with this scene with Riggsy. Oh, we just cut away from there. That's right. Um, and then we go back to, uh, Clara and the doctor at that like underpass area where there's a bunch of memorial stuff and it's just a really weird scene where, the, the guys who are like on community service are hanging around watching the spot where the, the memorial stuff is. And one of them says something like, don't worry, it might never happen. And I it's don't know like what he meant by that. They're afraid to go in there. Because the people who disappeared disappeared in there. But does he mean like you can go ahead in. It might not happen to you. Is that what he means? I think so. That's a weird way to say that. Um. Anyway, Riggsy says at one point, like, have some respect. He's She's grieving. And he's like, uh, sorry about that. I didn't mean anything by it. But yeah, it's sort of a weird moment where, because uh, she's, you know, walking down and she sees the illustrations of each person. And I really want to know what everybody thinks went on here because the, the what people have to assume, I guess, is that there is a serial killer on the loose who paints portraits yeah. of each victim in this tunnel. Yeah. And you would really think that would get more attention. You would think that there would be like camera crews camped out here, that there would be people hanging around because people love serial killers. That, that is- actually would be a really good movie where the serial killer abducts people or kills them, but then goes and paints them on walls. Here we go. It's right here. <laughs> you know, but it's just a weird bit where like, this, the, even if we were giving this a completely reasonable human exp- explanation, this is a bonkers thing to be happening. And people do not seem nearly as worried about it as they should. Yeah. Just guys. Well, and there's the indication that the people who have been disappearing are like low income, like, yeah not important people no Mm -hmm. one's gonna miss them but Riggsy even says like this one that's my aunt yeah yeah so she goes back to the TARDIS here she still hasn't like you know cottoned on to the fact that this is something that's supernatural and really weird 
And when she gets back, it's a tiny TARDIS and the doctor's face doesn't even fit out of it. And it's really funny. <laughs> um, and so she picks it up and just puts it in her bag. And he gives her a comm to put in her ear mm -hmm. and hacks her optic nerve so that he can see what she sees. Mm -hmm. And honestly, no, thank you. <laughs> I just don't like that. He doesn't tell her that's what it's going to do until he's done it. Yeah. Consent, sir, please just ask if you can hack her optic nerve before you <laughs> hack her optic nerve. That's all I'm saying. But he does not. She's just excited that she gets to pretend to be the doctor. Mm hmm. Yeah, he gives her his uh, screwdriver. And I just love the fucking hand that comes out of the TARDIS that is in her bag. It just looks so <laughs> weird. Um, so this is when things begin to get serious and she begins to realize that there is something going on. Uh, we have her, him watching through her eyes and her using the sonic screwdriver to sort of like scan the place basically, yeah. because he's trying to figure out what is drawing power so that the TARDIS keeps shrinking. And this is when she introduces herself to Rixie as the doctor. I don't really know what I'm a doctor of. I just think I use the title because it makes me sound important. I love this so much. <laughs> She's just really taking this opportunity to give the doctor a hard time. And I am all about it. Um, and eventually he says something that makes the doctor go, actually, this kid seems pretty smart. Hang on to him because we could use his, you know, Insight. Local knowledge. Local knowledge. That's it. Um, yeah, because at first he's like, no, this kid's an idiot. Get rid of him. And she says, no, he he knows the area. He knows what's going on. And then when Riggsy actually does say something that the doctor is impressed by, he's like, oh, you know what? He really could be useful. He's from the area. He knows what's going on. Meanwhile, she's like, wow, thanks. You think? Hmm. Cool. Where have we seen this happen before where a woman gives an, a suggestion and people are like, no, no. And then the man says the exact same thing and people are like, yes, yes. I love – so I've been using Calm to fall asleep at night. Mm -hmm. Have you ever used this app? No. I think I've talked about it on the show before. But they have these uh, what are called sleep stories that are meant to lull you to sleep and they're like you know 30 minutes long. And they work for me very well. And the ones that are my favorite are usually the um, train stories. And you travel to different places. And one of them, the one last night, there's a dude in the story mansplaining to a woman about like a piece of architecture. And it turns out in the story that she knows already. And I can't tell you guys how much that is not like a typical thing in these sleep stories for there to be any discussion about other characters other than yourself. It's almost always just you get on the train, you lean back, enjoying the rocking of the, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And for there to be anything with other characters and it to be a, like a guy trying to tell a woman a thing that it turns out she already knows about, it just really felt to me. Like somebody was in a fucking mood <laughs> when they wrote this. They were like irritated and they were like, you know what? This is going into the sleep story because I am sick of this shit. And I was just like, I was sort of laughing as I was falling asleep last night because I was like, man, this, uh, this does not feel like it goes together, but okay. <laughs> um, so he takes her to the room of like the, the apartment of one of the victims yeah. I don't understand why he has access to this or knows this at all. Um, so it's just taken says, for granted, like, oh, local knowledge, but like, why? That's he a refers weird to thing. it as an estate. So, what I believe, you know, how Rose lived in that big apartment complex? Mm -hmm. They refer to those as estates. Sure. Especially like in the parts of London or I guess Bristol or wherever in England where it's like the lower income people, they live in these estates. So I get the – like my headcanon would, is that 
this happened in the same building or the same estate that Rigsy lives in. But even so, like, because basically the, the equivalent in the U.S. is the projects. Mm-hmm. I have family that lives in the projects that they don't know other, like, that's not how it just goes by default and never mind the fact that he, like, can get into the guy's place. Well, I mean, he just opened the door. <laughs> how is it unlocked? I don't know. That shouldn't be. It's a, it's a police. Down. It's a crime scene, and it's just <laughs> open. This this is just one of those moments where I was like, "This does not make any sense," but it's fine. I just wanted to address it because it definitely got my attention. I was like, "This doesn't make sense." That he would like not only be totally aware of like where in the building this all is and everything, but also that he would be able to get in. This would be locked up. This wouldn't be allowed. Um, nevertheless, so this is when Clara says something about how he could still be in the room. He could just be really small. And I love this so much because he gets very uncomfortable. He immediately starts to be like, oh yeah, wow, maybe I gotta well, she go. She keeps talking about shrink rays. Oh my God. And she's talking to herself because she's talking to the doctor. So she just sounds like a lunatic right now. And I found this really funny, just especially because the doctor warns her, like, you're going to freak this kid out and make him, like, leave. And indeed, that is what happens. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, man, just stop sounding like such a fucking weirdo. And I'm like, when the doctor tells you to stop sounding like a weirdo, you really need to look at your life. Um, so this is when things begin to go off in this in this apartment and they eventually get like uh cornered basically well first they get a police officer oh right 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 she uses the psychic paper to say she's with MI6 or mm -hmm. MI5 and then the the doctor hands her a hammer a big sledgehammer because she thinks they must be in the walls or he thinks they're in the walls. And so mm -hmm. she like ends up pulling this big sledgehammer out of her purse. And I thought that the police officer is going to be like, oh, you're the one killing people. Standing that here suddenly. That would have been the smart thing to think, to be honest. <laughs> you're standing here with a sudden out of your Mary Poppins bag, I guess, mm -hmm. sledgehammer. And then she just starts like hitting the walls <laughs> and the police officer's just like i'm gonna go look in this other room <laughs> talk to my oh she gets a call right she gets a call from her boss so she just goes into the other room meanwhile letting this stranger just smash the wall this is what i just don't like when human beings don't act like human beings <laughs> you know like and this is what i mean with him just being able to like he knows which apartment he has access to the apartment the the cop doesn't behave like a fucking cop with appropriate suspicion or like uh you shouldn't be here this is a crime scene it mm -hmm. just doesn't like none of this works in terms of how people would react well, or behave the being part of mi5 might make this low-level cop that's Be true. Like, I forgot about that. That's true. Well, I guess you could do what you want. Weird as that might be. <laughs> Indeed. Um, do we get, I'm, I'm like watching the scene and I don't think, do we get an explanation? And I don't mean like an explanation really. I just mean like their assumption as to why the wall looks like the desert Yes, it's – the doctor says later, like, oh, that's a nervous system or maybe it's – oh, no, he, I think it is the doctor is who says it. thing. Right. Um, he says that's a blown up, like, close up image of a skin. Of skin. Right, right, right. Okay. So I was like, I feel like that that's mentioned, but I just couldn't remember what it was. Okay. Ew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. So, yeah, she gets got. I really am I, – I said before, the effect 
of when people get got is quite good. Mm-hmm. It's really, really creepy and and weird. Like it doesn't make sense to your eyes as it's happening, which it wouldn't. Um, and the effect of like the floor shifting as it comes at her, it's like not a substance. It's the actual matter moving around mm-hmm. and it looks so strange. And then when she gets like pulled into the floor, I kind of thought that there would be like a print of her on the floor the way there was with the other dude. Yeah. So then she just vanishes and I was like, but wait, what? But then we see as they step into the room, the like, you know, thing on the wall and you're like, what in the fuck? And then you begin to realize like, oh my God, that's really messed up. Um, Honestly, like I said, pretty gory. Like, yikes. You know, <laughs> Ugh, gross. Um, so eventually they get trapped in here because the handle goes flat. Mm-hmm. Um, they are like both kind of pile onto this chair that's hanging from the ceiling. It's really Be- fortunate that this one apartment has a hanging chair. Has a hanging chair. Yeah. It doesn't like... They, this, they can travel through whatever. So even if it, it's attached to the ceiling still, mm-hmm. it's not really any safer. But I guess it's fine. Um, and I'm going to jump ahead because I don't want to spend too much time since we have two episodes to get through. But eventually, some of the other crew for the community service thing get involved. And she, you know, winds up. At first, she tries to do the I'm MI5. The dude does not get fooled by her uh, fake paper. And then she has to just be like, I'm the one who's going to keep you alive. And they seem to like buy that, which I was a little bit surprised by. <laughs> I I mean, you know, if, if, if somebody was like just coming up to you and being like, I'm the one who's going to keep you alive. Well, that's after one of the creatures like kills one of the service workers. Yeah, but she's done nothing to prove that she can. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, the doctor often hasn't done anything to prove that he can yet either. That's true. That's true. They're giving her the same uh, benefit of the doubt that they'd give the doctor. I guess it doesn't ring true because men don't do that with women most of the time. But uh, <laughs> I can see what they're trying to do here, so I'll allow it. You're yeah, right. Stop with this radical feminism. You know? Um. So... Eventually, they there's this like uh, thing that doctor does trying to communicate with the like sound pulses through the what do you call it speaker? Yeah, I feel like is it intercom system? Is that like the same? Is that an intercom? It's like a loudspeaker. Yeah, in All an right. industrial area, so it probably is like. Where they make, you know, announcements, call somebody to an office or whatever. Yeah. Um, so they begin figuring out that, like, what they're doing is w- sort of warning them because the numbers on the, the jackets correspond to who gets got next. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of messed up is that they're just basically like, oh, just so you know, we're going to take that one next. And then they do. And the doctor, at the end, what he says, like, in his speech is, like, I tried to, like, give you all the benefit of the doubt, figure out what was going on and what you wanted and what you were after. But it just seems like you want to fucking kill all of them. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and, you know, lay the smack down now because you guys just suck and want bad things. And I just don't think that's okay. So sorry, but you're out. And I found it really funny in a way, just like how hard he tries to see eye to eye with them and figure out if there's a way we can all just coexist. But no, sadly not. Um, so they, they get cornered and she uh, eventually has to get one of the trains to stop that's heading towards the obstruction as they call it. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And by using the screwdriver to turn the light red and stop him. This is, uh, I read somewhere when I was a kid, and this has stuck with me forever because it was meant to, it was meant to stick with me in order to keep kids from like playing on railroad tracks, which is a thing that if a train is going at like 80 miles an hour and they hit the brake, it takes almost a full quarter of a mile for them to actually stop. So basically the warning is they may see you and they may break. And unless you are really fucking far away, it will not matter. You are still going to be hit with a train. Yes. Seems about right. I was trying to think of um, Stand By Me if the train was stopping when they were running across the railroad track bridge. But I it wasn't. don't think I've seen it. I read it. I read the body, mm-hmm. as it's called instead, but. So he hits the brakes in that scene? I don't think so. That's why I was quiet because I was trying to remember if if the train conductor was trying to brake because these children were running ahead of the train. Gotcha. But they like dive off to the side. I think it – if he was braking, he wasn't going to be able to sob for sure. This is just like – one of those things that it doesn't matter for this, like I understand they just have to have him stop and that's fine. But when I think about that, it's very frightening. That's a pretty yeah. like that's a that's a lot of of time. Damn. A lot of distance. Mm-hmm. Um and this is when we start to see the bad news, which is that they are beginning to take on a three dimensional shape. And they look so <laughs> freaky is there any trivia about how they did this no Ugh, i'm dying to know because like it really is wild looking it looks like a combination of a uh sort of a claymation and cgi mm-hmm. you know the sort of way that they're moving i don't know it's just a really weird unsettling it, 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 they look like watercolors almost because there's just no real features and there's the detail shifts around yeah because the the solidity of them isn't quite there it's just really cool looking i liked it uh meanwhile the doctor gets dropped on the tracks by that fucking guy mm-hmm. who just can't leave well enough alone because he sucks and that he has to like use his hand to pull him off the tracks. But once he does that, it tips again. And I don't know why he doesn't just reach out again and fix it again, because that wouldn't have taken long. But instead he just puts himself into like the equivalent of like sleep mode Mm -hmm. for the TARDIS. It's actually called siege mode. Siege mode. Okay. Okay. And the power it takes to go into siege mode is all that they had left. Mm -hmm. So the TARDIS can't come back out of it again. And he's not sure that he'll ever see Clara again. And says something about how she was a great doctor. Mm -hmm. But later on, cannot say that to her. And when she says, come on, come on, you can tell me I was good. He said, you were an exceptional doctor, but goodness has nothing to do with it. Which was sort of an odd flex. I, well, considering she was acting just like he would. Yeah, I just, I can't tell what he meant when he said it. Did he mean, yeah, you acted like me and I got to see what that was from the outside and it sucks? Does he mean... Yeah, you acted like me and I know I suck, so I wouldn't recommend continuing with that behavior. Or is it just like sort of that's nothing to be proud of? Maybe? Uh, I think it's the the last one. Like it's – he's trying – he's always trying to be good and do the right thing, but he has to make these hard decisions a lot of the time and, you know, some being good isn't – always the motivation. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's just, 
he seemed so mad when he said it. Like he seemed like mad at her, but it could be either himself too, I guess. Yeah. Um, it was just sort of an odd moment, you know, and I was like, I'm not entirely sure how to take that. And it seems like she isn't either because he walks away and she's just sort of standing there like, what the fuck? Um, but eventually what she does is she gets uh, Rigsy to paint a door on this sheet of paper and it looks real enough that they are like forcing energy into it, I guess, to make it look, make it go into three dimensions again. Or yeah, because they did that doing? with they did that with the door handle before. They flattened it. They had flattened it, and she, or she flattened it. She unflattened it, and they got into a room, and then she flattened it again using the little device that the doctor made up. Okay, and they were able to like reinflate it and turn the doorknob because they're, you know, working with this three dimension thing now. Okay. Gotcha. So what they were trying to do, they think that they're hiding behind a door. They're trying to make that handle three dimensions so they can open the door. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, this was actually a really cool idea. I, I liked this as the like solution. So they shove a bunch of energy into it to try and bring it back into usability. Yep. And all of that energy is going right through because it's not a door and into the TARDIS. So he's basically getting back all of the power that they drained. Yes. And uh, this brings him back to full power. And he manages to use the sonic screwdriver when he steps out after his little speech to blow them all away. And it looks like literally like he just, and they all like go blow flying backward. I don't really understand why it worked when he did it and she couldn't have done it. I don't know. Cause it's just the same tool that she's been using. Right. It's the yeah. same screwdriver. It's the same screwdriver, but I don't know. He probably knows how to adjust it for different needs better than he could explain to her how to do it. Hmm. Plus, the when the TARDIS comes back, its shields are able to go up too, which is keeping them at bay. Okay. That convenient shield it has sometimes. Right. Sometimes. Indeed. Um. Yeah, okay. Well, that didn't totally work for me, I guess, is what I'm saying. But I do like the way that they get back to full power. I thought that that was a neat idea. Mm -hmm. And just the overall, like, fact that Riggsy's art, like, his talent for artwork is what they use. Mm -hmm. I like, because there's a moment where he's trying to show her this awesome mural that he did. And he's like, did you like it? And she just goes, yeah, not bad. And barely even like glances at it. Yeah. And you can see how like devastated he is by it, mm -hmm. which you would be like, I remember being that age and all I just, I just wanted people to tell me that I was good. And I really appreciated that he gets a, like, he manages to sort of do something that is not only useful, but shows off that he's really fucking good. He fooled these aliens into thinking that was a real door. Like, that's pretty dope. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I like that. I kind of would like to see him again, but I don't think that we will. But he's an enjoyable character. Um, and let's see. Then when everybody is saved, we get that, like, awful moment with the fucking dude at the end who's just like, well, I don't care about those people who are dead because they were just scum. No big loss, but I'm still alive. So thanks for that. And the doctor's like, wow, I might have saved the wrong people. And uh, honestly, I'm like, Doc, your attitude sometimes isn't that far off from this <laughs> dude. So I don't want to like say you are the thing that you hate, but it does feel like maybe you want to rethink the way you talk about people or, you know, play with folks' lives. If the sound of this 
offends you because it's not that different really. Um, and it ends with, like I said, him saying, you know, goodness has nothing to do with it and sort of leaving Clara standing there looking frustrated until we go to Missy who is looking at Clara on an iPad, basically, and saying, my Clara. And I'm like, your Clara? What? Why? I have chosen well. And I'm like, chosen? What did you choose? And we don't know. But I will tell you one thing. I got a teeny tiny bit spoiled. Not on, no! what, not on what she is or does. Okay. But simply on the fact that Cybermen are involved. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. Um, so just uh, warning you all that there is, a, you know, a, a giant thumbnail that came up that had her standing next to one. And I was like, oh, God damn it. But like I said, I don't really know, like, what it is that she is trying to do still. It doesn't entirely like it's not making things make sense to me in context, so it doesn't ruin anything. Um, I like yeah. that she's like, "Oh no, it's the next episode." Never mind. What the Missy Forest episode? Yeah. What does she do? She's like, "Well, that was surprising," and I love surprises. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so next episode, the, well, uh, here, let me give you the one little piece of trivia I have for this episode. Oh, okay, cool. Um, this was written by the same guy who wrote, um, uh, the foretold, oh, the last episode, um, the train episode, another train episode. Hey. Um, uh, but he wrote this one first. This was his first script for the show. Two years before writing it, he had pitched his ideas for a story to Stephen Moffat but was unsuccessful. When he met, when he again met with the executive producer, he showed him four ideas for episodes complete with his own illustrations aided by his background in art college. Taking an interest in the monster he had created for what would become Flatline, Moffat asked Matheson to produce a story outline and he got the job to script the episode. It was only after writing several drafts that he was told the episode would need to lock the doctor away in a single location as Peter Capaldi's scenes for the episode needed to be filmed quickly to abide by the production schedule. Mm. Matheson decided to write a script where the doctor was in the dark. For this to be successful, he had to create an unknown quantity to feature as his alien enemy. Much like his next creation, The Foretold, he elected to have no dialogue for the aggressors, allowing something about them to remain unknowable. Hmm. Okay. Well, I do like the fact that they don't ever talk. I feel like that works really well. Mm-hmm. I and the beings in the of like the trees, the art, the lives that persist. What is it that they call themselves? I don't remember. Um, I feel like even though they do talk because they sound so weird and they speak in such a way, it still works. Cause oftentimes you do that and it's just sort of like all the mystery has gone. This isn't fun anymore, mm-hmm. but I do actually really like it in that case. I thought that that worked well. Um, so, okay, cool. Let me see who wrote the next one. Um, and the next one, it starts off. Oddly, with this like little girl running through the woods looking for him, mm-hmm. and when he opens the door, he like goes back in and tries to redirect to get to London, and she's like, "No, no, no!" But we're there though, and he's like, "No, we're in the middle of a forest," and she's like, "Yeah, that's kind of what I'm talking about. That's the problem." And this was sort of a neat one, actually. Um, in terms of like the the overall the concept of it and then what it turns out happens mm-hmm. is that the, the trees are like attempting to defend the planet and that this has happened before and we just don't remember it because if we did, we would be so consumed with fear that we wouldn't try to live. 
which um, does kind of ring true for me. I mean, our birth rates are down in the year of our COVID for a reason. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, in large part due to the fact that all of us are sort of like, what the fuck? This is no world to bring a child into. Or I can't afford it, which kind of comes back down to this is no world to bring a child into. Mm -hmm. It lines up. Um, so anyway, this is a bit of a strain though, just because of the fact that it relies so much on kids. Yep. And that's not easy. I don't feel like it suffers too badly. I feel like the kids are mostly pretty good. Yeah. They're well enough drawn. Mm hmm. Um, Their personalities seem to be pretty distinct. Yeah. It's uh, it's definitely like the kind of thing that at first I was like, oh, brother. Because the little girl that meets with him at first, I was starting to be a bit annoyed by. And That's, that's Maeve. Yeah. And Maeve winds up being sort of the key to things as we find out. Do we get an explanation as to why she has the link to no. these beings? It's nope. just like a coincidence? It's like a product of her trauma from her sister disappearing. Um, That's weird. So the, yeah, I mean, it's not explained. So that really is my assumption. Like, I guess this happened because she was so traumatized that her sister just disappeared. Um. The general feedback from our listeners about this episode was that it was pretty mixed. Mm -hmm. um, several people thought it was ableist or didn't like the anti-medication stance it seemed to take. Mm. Um, some liked the character development with the Clara and Danny relationship and some people found it boring and forgettable. Mm. I could totally I, – I feel it to be that one, boring and forgettable. The anti-medication thing, I definitely like also picked up on that and kind of felt a way, I won't lie, mm -hmm. <laughs> where I was just like, oh, really? The whole, you'd never want to listen. I'm like, yo, but people think that she's mentally ill. And I, the, the, it was sort of leavened for me by the fact that, first of all, Danny says, oh, like you listen to her, which I did appreciate. Yeah. And pointing out like, hey, dude, how about you stop levying criticism at us when you have been just as much, if not more of an asshole? And also the fact that everybody around her is so supportive of her taking her medicine, mm -hmm. even though the doctor is such a dick about it. I really did appreciate that everyone around her is like, hey, she's been in a bad place. Let her take her fucking medication. And they were really like compassionate about it in that way which I wasn't really sure how they were going to approach it, you know? So in that sense, I, I liked that, Yeah. but I can definitely see how people really felt the other way about it because it's not, this is, this is the thing. It's a similar, like with the, uh, moon is an egg episode where I don't really think that they meant to make it sound like they were taking a stand on a thing like that. Right. But you can't write something like that and not anticipate how somebody might hear it. And I think that's like a major failing if it doesn't even occur to you that that is how it will be taken by some people. Right. And especially because what they're indicating here before we find out that it's that she's hearing the voices of the whatever these creatures are that live already on our planet – that make trees grow to save us from catastrophes. Mm -hmm. There, the indication is she's schizophrenic. Right. Or at least that's the main, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know all of the, um, afflictions, but the one that most people know when you hear voices is schizophrenia. Right. She's running around, in a sort of weird kind of way because she hasn't taken her medication and for the doctor to say, no, don't, don't give her the medication. 
because what she's hearing is what we should be hearing too. And we should listen to her. Mm -hmm. We should listen to children or whatever. Like, what are you trying to say here? Like, I get what on the surface, what he's getting at. It's Mm -hmm. not about like medication is bad. It dulls your senses. And you know what she's, what's happening to her is special and unique and whatever. But if somebody has that kind of affliction or knows somebody with it and knows how painful it can be or how dangerous it can be Mm -hmm. saying the wrong person hearing, don't take your medication because you should be listening. It could be taken the wrong way. Yeah. So I get it. I get the, I get the criticism. Um, Like I said, I don't remember ever watching this. So, I went into this knowing that people felt that way. I don't feel I was influenced by that. I feel like I agree with them. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I understand that for sure. I'm not sure I see the, it being ableist unless you're talking about like having some kind of discrimination against people who have mental um, illness, mental illness. I couldn't think of the word. I'm like, what's the word? It starts with an I. (laughs) <laughs> mental affliction is what my brain wanted to do. And I was like, that's not right. Um, it's, it's sort of like maybe, and, and this might be not what people meant, but I will say that for me, I get a little bit twitchy around the suggestion of like, Oh, the, the mental illness actually turns out to be kind of almost a superpower. Right. You know, I always feel weird about that because I understand the impulse to try and like, sort of trick your audience a little bit or make something unexpected or interesting. But there's also a few, like it's sort of the same thing that can happen when you have a blind character that can practically see better than anybody because they have a whole other way of coping with the fact that they aren't sighted anymore. So their blindness becomes a superpower, which can be sort of like gross in its Mm -hmm. way, you know? So, yeah, what I'm saying is I don't know how to feel, but I can understand that this is just a fraught topic. And sometimes there's just the the impulse for me is like, if you don't really think you can handle doing this well, then just stay away from talking about it entirely. You know, yeah, just avoid it as a as a topic for your story. And we could say like, or, or not we because we wouldn't, but people could say. That, well, this was several years ago and we've come a long way since then and how we talk about this stuff, blah, blah, blah. But I don't think – I don't think they considered it. Agreed. At all. Yeah. That's kind of what I mean is like if if, if you write something like this and it doesn't even occur to you that people are going to take it this way, you probably shouldn't be writing about it. Because you're not sensitive enough to the topic at all to even anticipate the conversation that's going to spring up around it. There's a huge difference between how this inadvertently, seemingly inadvertently discusses mental illness and how Vincent and the doctor did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that being written by Richard Curtis, who wrote it as a love story for his sister who had committed suicide because of her mental illness. Mm -hmm tells the story of Vincent van Gogh and what he was dealing with in a much more sensitive way and in no way judges what's happening. Yeah. And this, I don't feel meant to come off the way that it does, but it comes off as very flippant about what this little girl is going through, whether it is that she has a mental illness or because she's been through a trauma with her sister disappearing. Mm -hmm. The only person who seems to be entirely sensitive to it is the other little girl who says she hasn't taken her medication. She has to take her medication. Yeah, exactly. And her sister just reappears at the end of the episode. Yeah. Everybody hated that. I do not fucking get it. I don't Why get it was either. she supposed to have vanished in the first place then? There's no there's no point to it. I just like I really thought that there was going to be some link to her and the tree like and that was why she could hear them at all. And then it's like completely not addressed. Her sister just literally materializes in front of her. 
Yeah, inside a hydrangea bush. It's truly baffling. It's like they... It's like they were telling a story that we didn't have any more of except that piece. That she... These little... Her sister disappeared. She can hear these voices and then they returned her sister to her. But we don't get any other parts of it. We don't know when she disappeared, how she disappeared, or why she would suddenly reappear. Were, was it the trees that took her? Because that's what it seems like. That's like how it felt to me. And but I, don't, I don't think that that's doesn't what seem it's like supposed what they're saying. To yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do not get it. Yeah, I'll, most of the people who responded about this episode, almost everybody was like, yeah, hey, the sister re- reappearing at the end. I just don't. It feels like, like a cheap, like, here's your happy ending. When really the happy ending is that these trees grow overnight to save the planet and then disappear again until they're needed. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I think it'd be really neat to suddenly walk outside and like, oh shit, everything's a forest. (laughs) The hell's happening. Yeah. I, I, okay. I, I'm struggling with the fact that I didn't miss anything and there just is no explanation for that because that's like, that's a huge thing to just drop in and not have explained. Like, that's bonkers that they just decided to not deal with that. What? It was, there was just, it's like they were trying to tell this like it's a fairy tale. And there are all kinds of fairy tale allegories going on with Maeve wearing a red jacket with a hood and oh, wolves. Right, yeah. The wolves. And lost in the forest and talking about gingerbread houses and name calling sleep, Sleeping Beauty. Like, they're obviously trying to do some kind of modern day fairy tale thing here. Mm-hmm. So, of course, at the end, in your typical fairy tale, you're going to have the return of the thing that's missing. Or we found whatever. Sleeping Beauty woke up, Snow White gets kissed and wakes up, whatever. But they didn't give enough detail for us to care. Yeah. And so it just feels slapped on. Mm hmm. Like, this is a fairy tale. We need a fairy tale ending. Oh, the sister pops out of a bush. Was she there the whole time? <laughs> oh, my God. That would have been so funny. Hi. Sorry. Isn't it? Isn't a happy ending enough that the mom and the daughter are reunited and the mom doesn't have to deal with the idea that her daughter, her second daughter disappeared too? I just don't really know why we need to have a trauma. Maybe the girl is just supposed to be schizophrenic. Like Oh, well, they really didn't want to go there, obviously. Which I'm like, well, why not? Because the idea that, like, her her sister disappears and suddenly she's hearing voices, that's a weird parallel yeah. to try to draw. That doesn't really make sense either. So I just don't – I just don't get, like, why the whole sister disappeared even had to be a part of the story in the first place. You just leave that out. Yeah. And this works perfectly fine. And then you don't have to have her just suddenly fucking materialize out of thin air like a... F- I, it was just... <laughs> I, I can't... I just... I'm trying to wrap my head around the sister disappeared story because I thought that it was going to be linked to her hearing the trees somehow. And to find out that's not the case, then it doesn't make sense why they happened at the same time. Why the sister's disappearance timing... Cor- cor- corresponds to her suddenly hearing the trees. What is that? Why would that happen then? I don't have an answer for you. <sighs> I want so to say irritated. that my favorite character in this episode is the other little girl, Ruby, because oh I God. find her hilarious. The one who's like, it's right there. It's not lost. It's there <laughs> at the top. Miss says I have no imagination. <laughs> I love that. You can ask her. <laughs> I just, I really enjoyed that character because she's observant. But also just everything is just very literal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So well, why do we need to find X? It's right there. I, that's, I don't know. I found it very funny. Yeah. <laughs> and I found it 
to be her like whole everything is literal thing was also not some kind of code for autism. Oh, true, true, true. That didn't occur it was, to me, but it that was could just easily this, have been done. Yeah, it was just this little girl who's like she has no imagination. So, I, why are you telling me to find something I can see right there? You drew it. <laughs> Uh, um, I'm trying to think because like, honestly, I don't really feel like we need to go beat by beat through this episode. I was going to suggest it. It doesn't make sense enough to bother, to be there's honest. Some, there's some, you know, neat things in there, but there's not enough of a plot to go very deep into. Mm-hmm. I liked the tiger. Apparently I wasn't paying close enough attention to see how bad the actual CGI was. I was just like, cool, tiger. <laughs> um... I liked the wolves. Apparently, I'm going to have to go back and maybe if you've got the episode up, you can tell me in the notes or in the trivia, it said that one of the wolves practically looks like a Labrador. Oh my God. I did not notice that, but I tend to just sort of like not pay a ton of attention because I know that the wolves are going to look like dogs. So I'm just watching it with this sort of prepared suspension of disbelief. Um, I'm trying to find the spot, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not in the right place for the wolf attack. <laughs> um, but I thought that was funny. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Here it is. Uh, oh, my God. This is when she starts flinging her hands all over the place. Um, all right. I got one. And he does look – he doesn't even look like a, a husky the way that some of them do or whatever. They. He looks more like a coyote because he's so brown and lanky. Um but I don't see the one that they say looks like a Labrador. Okay. I might have just missed it, though. I might just be in the wrong spot for this, what they intended. I'm also not sure that shining a flashlight in a tiger's eyes is going to make it go away. But Yeah, right. that was a weird thing where I'm like, I'm willing to believe it because I can scream at my cat to go away. <laughs> and she will not budge. But if I blow a puff of air in her face, she <laughs> fucking sprints in the other direction. Like I just electrocuted her. I would really like for you to record Ripley running for me sometime. Oh my god. It, it's not really a run. It's a waddle, right? It's not even a waddle. It's like... What's the word I want? It's like a controlled rock. <laughs> Like, a, like, I guess it's sort of what a gallop is, but a gallop implies more control. <laughs> and this is much more like the, the motion is uh, not entirely under her control and she can't <laughs> stop as easily as she would like. It's sort of decided for her whether she I can stop to. by a combination of factors <laughs> from whether there's a carpet under her that she can sink her claws into to make herself stop Or if there is a wall that she can slide (laughs) into and off of to go into whatever direction she would like next. (laughs) The picture of my head is so funny. I just really need you to record it for me. (laughs) Yeah, that cat is a mess. Sansa, when she runs... It's so funny because her legs are so short and she's so fat. And it's like this low to the ground waddle, but it's really fast. And it's so funny. Uh, Our little fat cats should be friends. Ripley. I know. I know that I shouldn't find it as amusing as I do. Because it's very problematic. And like, if I were talking about a person, this would be fucked up. But I sincerely think something happened to Ripley. I think she has a little (laughs) bit of brain damage or something. And so her reactions to things don't make a ton of sense sometimes. She'll just have like... Uh, I wish that I could film because it's like it takes it's over too long an extended period of time. But just the way that she behaves in response to whatever stimuli feels very (laughs) arbitrary. So she'll just sprint around over nothing. And I'm just like watching her like what's going on. And meanwhile, 
Arya's at like reclined and perfectly relaxed. So whatever it is, isn't getting her worked up. But Ripley's out here crashing into furniture, <laughs> jumping up onto like the end tables and knocking shit down. So like, it's not like she destroyed anything, but she definitely knocked over my water bottle, my cell phone, the remote control and a pile <laughs> of postcards. And then just flies into the next room going <laughs> over nothing. And you're just like, what is happening? It feels like you're under attack in your house. <laughs> But nothing is wrong. And a second later, she just climbs into your lap and purrs and falls asleep. And you're like, oh, what? Why? Why did you just settle down? What even, what's going on? It's very, it's very confusing. It gets me concerned and then it's for nothing. <laughs> I, and, and it gets me angry because she's knocking all my shit over. She's she's tough, man. She's very cute, and that <laughs> is the only reason why I haven't made her into a pie or something by now. <laughs> <sighs> she's a lot. <laughs> uh, she sounds so fun. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, is there anything else that you wanted to add about this one? Um, the title of the episode in the forest of the night is taken from a verse of William Blake's, the tiger presaging the appearance of the tiger. Okay. And the line is tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night. The actual title makes a minor modification of the line changing forests to forest singular. Gotcha. So that whole title was just because a tiger shows up at one point. I guess. Yeah. Okay. I guess. <laughs> um, we have a review. Hey, what's up? Favorite show plus favorite podcast equals fantastic. Five stars by Aww. Adri Blakely from the U.S. Started unspoiled with the Harry Potter series and was so excited to hear about Doctor Who. Doctor Who is my favorite show and I'm excited to experience it all over again with someone new. Uh, apologies by the time you get to this episode for all of the mm -hmm. disliking of the show we've had. <laughs> <laughs> That is not our fault. We cannot be held responsible for that. Nope. It is the, all the fault of the writers of this show. Indeed. But that is all I have. Do but have I appreciate patrons? your review. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Do we have um, patrons? We do. We have two new patrons. We have Kevin Baumgartner. Baumgart Baumgartner? I'm not sure. Baumgartner, I think. Uh, so hello, Kevin. And we have Carlo, who just signed up today, actually. Hi, Carlo. Welcome. So yeah, welcome to both of you delightful people, and I, I got, hope that you enjoy yourselves. I got very um, confused for a second because the guy who plays Kevin on The Office, his name, his last name is Baumgartner. Ah. And I was like, wait, Kevin Baumgartner? You thought it was him. From The Office? And I was <laughs> like, wait, no, that's not his name. His name is Brian. <laughs> okay. So I had a moment of like, wait, what? That's funny. Um. Yeah, I just, uh, not as many this time, but that's because I am actually staying on top of saying hello to them, which is a novel thing for me to do. So I feel very proud of myself. I'm um, proud of you too. You know, guys, it's a step. Um, I don't really have any announcements. I feel like uh, everything is pretty much proceeding. There's nothing new that's starting exactly. Um I guess the one thing is that I just recently began for Spoil Me covering what we do in the shadows. Have so you watched it yet? I watched the first episode. I've watched the film. Um, and so I knew like generally what I was getting into, but I wasn't sure how much the TV show aligned with the film. Mm -hmm. And the first episode is really funny. That was a good time. I am pretty excited about this one as a project to cover. Is what we do in the shadows a Taika Waititi project? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I really need to watch it. Have you seen Jojo Rabbit? I have not. Oh my god. <laughs> Please watch Jojo Rabbit. I have heard very good things about it. Um, it's, it's very good. <laughs> and you will find yourself laughing at Hitler and feeling very weird about it. That's what I've heard. I've heard a lot of people be like, I enjoyed it, but I feel weird about enjoying mm -hmm. it. And that seems to be the consensus for a lot of people. It's a goddamn delightful movie. 
<laughs> which is so weird to say because his imaginary friend is Hitler, but it's really fun. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much what's going on there. Still covering Miss Born with Miles, which has been a lot of fun. We're edging up into the end of book two, and um, other than that, you're going you're all going to start hearing a lot more about wedding plans because. I'm starting to get close enough that I have to refocus on do- getting the planning done. So expect that to come up more and uh, either be bored or delighted by it, <laughs> as is your preference. Last night, I got an email that my favorite band is like rescheduling their tour that was supposed to be happening this spring for mm-hmm. later in the year. And so I went to look at the tour dates and they're not coming here as of yet. But they were going to be in St. Louis, like mid-November, like a week before my birthday. Okay. And my former roommate slash one of my best friends lives in St. Louis. So I actually almost bought tickets and just be like, okay, I'm going to buy three tickets. Jason and I will fly out there. We'll take Jamie with us. We're going to go see Not A Surf. And, but then I thought about it and I was like, Natasha's wedding is the beginning of December. And am I really going to be able to get time off? Once before Thanksgiving and once after Thanksgiving. Mm. And while I control my schedule, I didn't feel comfortable enough planning to go to a different state to see my favorite band when I know I have to get the days off to go to your wedding. So I appreciate you and your sacrifice. Yeah. I uh, Hopefully they'll just come here. <laughs> um, yeah. I guess it's like, it's probably hard for bands to make plans right now because like, Everything is still so up in the air. Like I'm proceeding as if the wedding is going to happen. And I feel pretty confident at this point with the vaccine rolling out the way that it is that that will Mm -hmm. happen. But it really, I was not feeling so hot about it. Like, you know, just a couple weeks ago, even I was starting to be like, oh my God, what if this, what if I have to push it back again? I don't know what I'm going to fucking do. Um, So I am at least glad that, it looks like that's going to be possible. Yeah. I mean, movie theaters are starting to plan on movies actually opening. Mm -hmm. Like black widow is opening in July in theaters. It's also going to be on Disney plus, but it's, they're making a plan. And I, at first I was like, what the fuck are you doing Disney? And then I thought about it and I was like, well, if we all have our vaccinations by then going to the movies, shouldn't be life risking. We'll see. I hope we'll see. not. Like, because it's all dependent on how many people actually get vaccinated and whether or not there are a bunch of mutations. Yeah. Which is the other thing that can happen. And, um, you know, it has happened already a couple times. So I'm just. But the vaccine should still fight against that, right? It would if everybody was vaccinated within a given time frame, I think. If, no, if, I mean, like, like, if you have the vaccination and you come across one of the new strains, your vaccine should still combat it. You just might get a little sick, but you're not going to get, like, deathly ill. I don't know how that works with, like, giving it to somebody <laughs> else, though. Oh, no, that's true. You know? Right. Um, I'm selfish, and I was just thinking about myself. <laughs> well, it's like it's just the kind of thing that that's the the concern is that if things become really uh contagious again. Yeah. That will really be what causes us to have to regress into lockdown yet again. So, I'm just hoping that's not where we go. I hope that's not where we go because looking at the way things are around here, everybody's acting like it's, you know, 2019 Mm -hmm. again my store has gotten like i live in texas i know it's been like since november people have just been like yeah we're going to dinner at jalapeno tree it's fine i've just noticed in the last two weeks my store has made more money daily in the last two weeks than we've made since 2019 yep and we're way busier there's traffic all the time now again it's like everybody has just decided it's over mm-hmm. and we're still rolling out the vaccine. They just today opened it up to everyone 16 and over. So we went from 
severe restrictions last week of 65 and over to 16 and over this this week, which means they have it to give. They well, didn't have good. it last week, which yeah. is great, but they didn't have it last week. And the people I'm seeing out are not 65 and over. Mm, but y'all are acting you. like like it's like you're all vaccinated and you're good. I, however, am getting my first shot on Saturday. I am very excited for you, and I hope that you're able to get your second shot with no problem. I don't know well, how long it's supposed to be. Is it a month it's between the first and second? Three weeks to a month, depending on which one you get, I believe. Okay. Um, yeah. My, my friend is pulling sure. some strings, so... Um, she works for a company that has been doing COVID testing this whole time, and um, now they're doing the vaccine. And she pulled in a favor with her boss because it was looking – with my dad moving here, like it was just – I still wasn't eligible, and mm-hmm. Jason's not eligible. And so she went to her boss, and she was like, I've been with you guys since June. I've worked really hard. I've never missed any work. I need a favor. Mm-hmm. And so I, we get to go on Saturday. I made a backup appointment for Thursday just in case something falls apart because I have no faith in anything. <laughs> but um, potentially Jason and I are getting our first shot on Saturday. Good for you. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, I, I'm really like – Owen was able to get his first one um, like day before yesterday, I think. And uh, so that means that both of us hopefully will be all done by next month. Yeah. Fingers crossed. So. And hopefully everybody else or, you know, the majority of people will too. Mm -hmm. Because I would like things to go back to normal. I'm not saying I'm going to go see Black Widow in the movie theater because I don't trust anything anymore. This this pandemic has broken me, but I'm excited for things to be a little less scary. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I just, I really, all I am worried about right now is hoping that we can have our wedding. And that's really, uh, other than that, I don't plan on doing all that much differently than last year because it's just too soon. Yeah. But that is late enough in the year that I don't, if it were, you know, if we were planning on having it in July, I would have pushed it back already by now. Mm -hmm. I'm just not playing with that. But December... I feel like, fingers crossed, that should be okay. I hope so. That's like nine months from now. You know, just saying. Yeah. Um, so anyway, guys, uh, sorry, but, <laughs> you know, gotta got to talk what's going on in the world occasionally. Yeah. I hope that y'all are out there getting your vaccines, being responsible. And, um, you know, those of you who qualify for it just go just go do it baby just get on it yeah i read from a healthcare professional that said look if you have the opportunity to get it just get it Mm -hmm. yeah i struggled with it a little bit because my qualification is being overweight and it felt like other than that i'm actually very healthy and i feel like i'm taking it from people and then i just started like kind of sat back and thought about it and i was like but getting it helps those people too Yeah. So I may as well just go ahead. If they're going to qualify me for it, then just, you know, I'm going to get it eventually. May as well just do it right away. Yeah, exactly. So go for it, guys. Do it. Don't be weirded out by whatever it is that causes you to qualify. Right. And don't be scared that this they created this vaccine too fast and it's, you know, not safe. It's totally safe. The reason it was created fast is because there was no red tape involved. Right. So they were able to really do it and... It's been tested and it's safe. So get it so that you can protect everybody around you as well. And I personally had almost no reaction to it at all. Like I had some extreme fatigue the day after because that was my reaction to COVID also because I tested positive, as you guys know. And COVID did not hit me very hard. I just got extremely tired. Other than that, hardly any symptoms. Owen had uh, pain in his arm and real tiredness also. Um, His arm really was killing him the next day. I didn't have that. So, you know, both of us, it hasn't been bad. And I know it's different for everybody. But, you know, if you're worried about that, I think that if you're otherwise healthy, 
it probably isn't going to be an issue for you at all. That's um, what I've heard from most people is that they had like their arm was sore or they were a bit tired. Mm -hmm. One guy I work with, he got his first dose last week and he said he was like just his brain was like foggy the next day. He just had a hard time focusing. And I was like, that's weird. That sounds like a you thing because I haven't heard anybody else have that symptom. Hmm. Yeah. But um, my mom, when she got her, she said it just hurt her arm. That was it. She mm-hmm. also said that the first one, the needle was really small, and the second one, the needle was really big. Oh, interesting. <laughs> All right. Noted. And she had more fatigue, and um, I think she had a headache the day after her second one. They do recommend it when you get your second one to try to take the next day off work just so you can allow your body to like deal with the second dose, which okay. it seems to be a bit stronger. Well... Luckily, I control my own schedule in that regard, mostly. Yeah. So hopefully I can do that. And I, the first dose, like the needle, I didn't even like really feel it. It was kind of odd because I've had plenty of of shots before and uh, it's never like nothing. And this one actually hurt way less than any other shot I've ever gotten, which surprised me. So I guess uh, that's because it was the first one and I better fucking saddle up and get ready for (laughs) dose two because it's not going to be like that. Well, and she said the second one, she's like, it's not like it was, it was just a much bigger needle, but she's like, it still just felt like, you know, when you get a tetanus shot or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Um, It goes deeper into your muscle, I guess. Well, anyway, sorry guys for the detour, but I hope that you guys are all doing your thing out there and being careful. Please continue to be careful. Yes. And we love you. And we will see you next week with two more episodes. So get ready for that. Until next time. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Bye. an unspoiled network podcast.